Henry Horner Homes, Chicago, Illinois. If I have to live here and my kids are here, then I'm going to fight too. Because I have to fight with the gang every day. I have to fight with the drug addict. The lights, the trash, the elevator, the stairway. The guy in the middle of the playground's got the gun. He's got on a white shirt. You all, the tech team was walking up now. All right, you want out? The Henry Horner Projects, named after Illinois' first Jewish governor, Henry Horner, stand as a significant development in the state's history. Governor Horner, who served from 1933 until his death in office in 1940, became the namesake for this housing initiative. Construction on the projects began shortly thereafter, culminating in a series of seven buildings, each seven stories tall, and four additional 16-story high-rises, altogether comprising 920 units. Completed in 1957 by the renowned architectural firm Skidmore, Owings & Merrill, the Henry Horner projects were noted for their economical construction. They stand as some of the most cost-effective housing developments of their time, contrasting with other projects built throughout the late 1950s and 1960s. The initial construction of the Henry Horner projects marked the arrival of several prominent gangs in the area. The Egyptian Cobras, Imperial Chaplains, and 14th Street Clovers were the first to colonize these buildings, establishing themselves as the three powerhouses within the complex. However, the landscape changed in 1960 when the Vice Lords appeared on the scene, swiftly asserting their influence they became the dominant force within the projects, overshadowing the initial three gangs and reshaping the dynamics of power and control within the community. In 1961, a significant extension to the Henry Horner projects was undertaken by Quinn and Christensen. This new phase introduced seven additional buildings to the complex. Four of these were 14-story high-rises, while the remaining three stood at eight stories each. With these new structures, an additional 736 units were added to the existing development, bringing the total number of units at Henry Horner to 1,656 across 18 buildings. The final stage in the development of the Henry Horner projects came with the construction of the Horner Annex. Completed in 1969, this annex featured 109 more units, spread across one seven-story building and two three-story row houses. This marked the culmination of a grand and sprawling urban housing initiative, reflecting both architectural innovation and the evolving needs of the community. By the mid-1960s, the Vice Lords had become the main gang in the Henry Horner projects. They took control from the 14th Street Clovers, pushed out the Egyptian Cobras and were stronger than the Imperial Chaplains. The Vice Lords were now in charge. In 1968, the scene at the Henry Horner projects became more complex when the Supreme Gangsters moved in from Englewood. They started heavily recruiting in the extensions, leading to a significant rivalry with the Vice Lords. A year later, in 1969, the Supreme Gangsters evolved into the Gangster Disciples, creating a long-standing presence of Gangster Disciples in these buildings. Around the same time, the Gangster Stones were founded in the 150 Lake Street building, a location they called the Fortress. As part of the Black Pea Stone Nation, the Gangster Stones establishment in the Henry Horner Projects put the Black Pea Stones on the map in the area further adding to the intricate tapestry of gang affiliations and rivalries within the community. In 1971, a major shift occurred within the Henry Horner projects when the Imperial Chaplains were entirely overtaken by the Vice Lords. This conquest led to the Imperial Chaplains becoming a branch of the Vice Lords, known as the Imperial Vice Lords. By 1975, this group had evolved further into the Imperial Insane Vice Lords, establishing a significant presence within the buildings. This development was a testament to the ever-changing landscape of power and affiliations within the community. Uh, the stairwells were clean, there were lights, it was 
We had a baby playground and a big playground. Uh, there were benches, grass, it was beautiful. I mean, it was really nice. 20 years later, life at Henry Horner has changed. To a passerby, it's hard to tell whether the buildings are occupied or abandoned. In its early years, the Henry Horner projects were considered an ideal place to live. The complex was well maintained, clean and functional, contrasting with the nearby deterioration and increasing gang activity in the projects during the 1960s and 1970s. The Horner complex managed to stay relatively low on crime during this period, maintaining a reputation as a desirable residence. However, this image dramatically changed in 1981 when the situation in the complex took a turn for the worse. The Chicago Housing Authority CHA, found itself unable to fund necessary renovations, causing many longtime residents to leave. As vacancies increased, the empty apartments became an opportunity for criminal elements to move in. Gangs, criminals, and addicts quickly filled the void left by departing residents, transforming the once thriving complex into a hub of criminal activity and marking a dark chapter in its history. Henry Horner's decline was rapid, and by the mid-1980s, the project complex had become one of the most dangerous in the city. What had once been a well-maintained community was now the battleground for vicious and bloody gang wars particularly over control of the drug trade. During the 1980s, the complex was overrun by various gangs, including the Gangster Disciples, Four Corner Hustlers, Imperial Insane Vice Lords, Traveling Vice Lords, and Gangster Stones. These groups asserted control over the buildings, and the violence escalated. Peace Stone Nation further complicated matters by granting control of the 150 Lake Street buildings to the Gangster Stone chapter, putting the notorious gang leader Henry June Bud Brown in charge. His reign lasted until 1998, when he was convicted of kidnapping and torturing a man to death within the complex. The territorial control within the Henry Horner complex became clearly defined among the gangs with a exerting dominance over specific sections. The Gangster Stones took control of the majority of the buildings in the older section of Henry Horner. The rest of the older buildings were run by the Imperial Insane Vice Lords and Traveling Vice Lords, with patches controlled by Four Corner Hustlers. The Gangster Disciples ruled the extensions, maintaining a firm grasp on that area. This division of territory among the gangs not only created distinct spheres of influence within the complex, but also set the stage for ongoing conflict and competition as they vied for control, further contributing to the complex's reputation as one of the city's most dangerous places. If I have to live here and my kids are here, then I'm going to fight too, because I have to fight with the gang every day. I have to fight with the drug addict, the lice, the trash, the elevator, the stairway, the rats, the roaches. This, the whole, let's show a clear picture. This is the clear picture here. This is the clear picture of CHA. The conditions of the buildings in the Henry Horner complex were falling apart. Elevators often didn't work, and trash chutes were so full that they caused fires. The hallways smelled bad because of trash and waste and there were roaches and rats everywhere that couldn't be gotten rid of. Even if you kept your apartment clean, windows were broken and they let in water when it rained. The scariest thing was that you could get from one apartment to another through the medicine cabinets by pushing them out. So people were afraid if the apartment next door was empty. The whole place was in chaos, not just because of the gangs and drugs, but also because the buildings themselves were in such bad shape. In 1991, the residents of the Henry Horner projects had reached a breaking point, and they took legal action against the Chicago Housing Authority. They were living in squalid conditions, essentially abandoned by those responsible for their welfare. As a result of the lawsuit, an agreement was reached by 1995 that provided the residents the option to be placed in better housing. 
This legal victory coincided with the city receiving the HOPE 6 grant, a federal program aimed at revitalizing the most distressed public housing projects. The lawsuit and the grant worked hand in hand to finally bring some hope to those who had endured years of neglect and danger in the projects. Starting in 1996, the first phase of demolition began at the Henry Horner projects, signaling the beginning of much needed change. During this initial phase, which lasted until 2000, 466 of the original 1,765 units were demolished. The second phase commenced in 2001 and continued until 2010, resulting in the removal of the remainder of the old complex. Residents who chose to stay were relocated into newly built mixed income units that replaced the old, deteriorating buildings. These redevelopments marked a significant turning point transforming the area from a neglected and dangerous environment into a place with renewed hope and improved living conditions. The Henry Horner projects encapsulate a story of urban evolution, from initial promise to eventual decay, and then hopeful transformation. Initially hailed as an architectural and economic marvel, they soon became a canvas for gang wars, social challenges, and infrastructural neglect. For many decades, they served as a stark reminder of the city's challenges in balancing housing needs, social justice, and public safety. The resilience of the residents, however, cannot be overlooked. Their collective actions, culminating in a lawsuit against the Chicago Housing Authority, led to significant reforms and much-needed change. Today, the revitalization of the area serves as a testament to the potential for communities to reclaim and redefine their space. While the memory of the Henry Horner project's tumultuous past remains, it also stands as a beacon of hope for the future of urban development and the power of community activism.